Hi, I'm Stephanie Rublitz. Welcome to my channel. Today we are talking about how to shop for a sewing machine. Okay, so I want to be really clear. This is not like a consumer report, 10 best, whatever, in a price range. That's not what kind of video this is. I'm not gonna list off a bunch of machines and tell you which one to buy because ultimately the only person who can choose which machine is best for you is you. What I am gonna do, however, is I'm gonna walk you through some of the features that are great to look for, some of the things you maybe don't need to bother messing around with, as well as some of the things that get like really hyped up at sewing machine dealers that maybe don't deserve the hype that they're given. So the first big consideration I think is, are you gonna go vintage machine or newer machine? I have both. I love my newer machine and I love my vintage machine. Now, vintage machine, I'm talking like, 70s and earlier and these are machines well maybe some early 80s machines these are machines that have a lot more metal components they're a lot simpler they have a lot less bells and whistles but they will work for years and years they are workhorses these are machines that don't just last years or decades they last generations and so yes typically you're getting maybe 6 to 12 stitches in these machines but they're all the basic stitches that you need to do most of the things um, some of these machines will have decorative stitches or there will be additional cams that you can get to put in top of the machine um, that will give you extra stitches. They are fairly easy to fix. Usually the components um, are easy to swap in and out. So that's why these machines can be repaired over and over and over again and fully refurbished and then you can go on and keep using it for decades longer. Now sometimes your decision on whether you go vintage or new is going to be informed by your budget. Both vintage and new machines can really run the gamut on budget. Now for vintage machines, sometimes it really depends on where it's being sold. If there's a culture there of wanting vintage things, maybe it'll be a little more expensive. But where vintage machines are going to save you money over the long term is going to be with the maintenance. This is the manual for my 1970s Kenmore. It has very clear and detailed instructions on how to clean, oil, and maintain my machine. My manual for my Janome does not. It's really hard to get the plastic cover off and for the first little while that I owned it, I, if I even tried to do that, I would have voided my warranty. The idea with a newer machine is they want you to take them in yearly to have that maintenance done on them. And maybe that's a good thing because of the computerized components being more delicate, there's probably a point to that. But it is something to consider when you're looking at that bottom line. If you're maintaining your own vintage machine, often, even if you sew on it a lot, if you take it in every three or four years just to have a tune-up and make sure that everything's working right and that there's no like wires that are needing replacing or anything like that, you'll be fine. Also, a vintage machine has components that were made to come apart and go back together so that it would be easy to fix. Newer machines, not so much. Sometimes the components are not really meant to be replaced. And so when a new machine is done, it's done. If your motherboard goes on your computerized machine, you can expect the repair on that to start at 400 bucks. And just like we were talking about a vintage machine lasting for generations, a new machine you can reliably expect to get 10 to 25 years out of. So for me, in terms of durability, in terms of longevity, in terms of being able to do all my servicing myself and long-term costs, I do prefer a vintage machine. They're beasts, they will last you forever. But there are features that they don't have, which is why we have newer machines too. Now a lot of people will get really hung up on um, the added features of a new machine, especially if they're a new sewer, because they'll have this idea that more features means that it's a machine they will grow into. Um, I'll be honest, you ask most seasoned sewers and there's like four stitches that they <laughs> sew everything on. And, and they only need those four stitches if they're sewing stretch and rigid fabric. Now certainly a newer machine gives you far more adjustment in your needle head placement. So if you're wanting to really fine tune where your stitches are gonna be or how wide your stitches are, you have a lot more room to play there. Features that you can find on a newer machine that you can't find on an older machine are things like the needle up and down placement. So on my new machine, I can set it so that every time I take my foot off the pedal and the machine stops, the needle is through the fabric. This is super helpful if you were doing something that's really finicky, where you're pulling out pins along the way, or where you, you're really worried that when you lift your hands to adjust your hands on the fabric that things are going to shift. 
it's super helpful. I use it all the time. You also have the ability to switch stitches really fast, and that comes in really handy. There are needle threaders, there are knot tires, there are thread cutters. And I don't mean just the little blade that goes on the side that you can pull your thread through. I mean ones that will cut it right in the machine. There's auto tension controls, and oh my god, like the one step button holder is everything. But beware, okay? Don't just get sidetracked by the shiny things. If you are looking at a machine that is lower on the price point, but it has like 300 stitches, really make sure it's not missing anything. Sometimes what will happen is those 300 stitches will be used to grab your attention where the quality of the product's not really there. This is not a machine that's gonna last for a really long time. Or they will omit things that have been standard on machines for like 200 years. Things like the pressure adjustment on the presser foot. So this is the adjustment on how much pressure is holding your fabric underneath your presser foot. This is a thing that's been standard in sewing machines forever, and now there's newer machines that are like bottom of the line in whatever brand it is that don't have that adjustment anymore. Um, this is one thing that I didn't even know I had to look for when I got my new machine because I just assumed that it was on all sewing machines. But I got a quilting machine and so they skimped out on putting that in. It's frustrating. It's so frustrating. This is why I always sew stretch fabric on my 1970s machine because it's impossible to do it on my new machine. Because that presser foot has one consistent pressure, my stretch fabric gets stretched out when my feed dogs pull it through. There's no way around it, and it sucks. Another thing that can be missing on a machine that you really wanna take a look at is whether or not there's the ability to lower your feed dogs. So if you don't know, your feed dogs are the little metal teeth under the presser foot that pull your fabric through. Sometimes if you're working on something really stretchy or something really delicate, or if you're doing free motion quilting, um, you wanna be able to just handle your fabric yourself and not have something forcibly pulling it through. Now if you do find a machine that you feel is like perfect for you and the only thing wrong with it is you cannot um, deactivate the feed dogs, it's usually like a switch kind of at the back behind the feed dogs. If you can't do that, um, you can like tape a playing card over top of them and it'll just like hit the, the playing card and you'll be able to move your fabric on top of that. So to me it's not like a deal breaker but it's irritating when that adjustment isn't there. Let's talk motors. AC or DC, that is the question. But it freaking shouldn't be. I have heard this talked about on sewing podcasts. I have seen people at machine distributors talking about it, like as though whether you have an AC or DC machine means your machine is better or worse. It's not. Let's back up. For those who don't know, AC is alternating current, DC is direct current. Your house runs on AC current. If you're in North America, well, Canada anyway, your house is running on AC current at 60 hertz. So that means every minute your electricity is interrupted 60 times. So if you're powering a lamp, that lamp is turning off 60 times for a fraction of a second. We don't notice it, we can't perceive it because the filament in the light bulb is still like yellow hot and producing light, so it doesn't really matter. Direct current is exactly that. It's the kind of current that's produced by your vehicle. So what is said about machines is that direct current, because it is consistent, is going to give you a more powerful, tougher, better running sewing machine. Now the older, more mechanical machines are all gonna be AC. They run on a universal motor and universal motors work great for sewing machines. They have for since forever. The reason manufacturers have started using DC motors in a lot of sewing machines is because our machines are becoming more and more computerized. A DC motor is what can take direction from a computer which gives you infinite programmability and way more stitches and way more options as compared to a mechanical cam stack with an AC motor that's going to have a lot less options. So when we're talking about AC versus DC, they have different functions, okay? AC is for a more mechanical machine and DC is for a more computerized machine. What I have seen happen in the selling of sewing machines is people will try and sell a DC motor based on the fact that it's somehow better or tougher or whatever and, and it's just, it's not. It has a different purpose. So it goes in a different kind of machine. That's literally all it is. There is nothing wrong with universal motors with an AC power. They, they work fine and they will work forever. All right, let's talk amps now. 
Amps is a, a unit of electrical strength. So it can seem logical that a machine with more amps is going to be a stronger machine and stab your fabric with more force. Not quite. There are a lot of things at play when it comes to the power of a machine and how much force that machine is going to have. Mainly, how many friction points does it have? Anytime you have like pieces, components rubbing together in a machine, that's a friction point and it's like working a brake on a machine. And so if you're having to power through that brake, then that is something that is decreasing the output of your machine. So when a salesperson is telling you, well, this one has so many more amps than this one, it probably takes more amps just to run the machine. It doesn't necessarily mean that it has more output power. And over time, your output's gonna change based on how well you maintain your machine and if it's oiled regularly. Therefore, a more simple mechanical motor is going to require less amperage than maybe another motor, but it, it doesn't mean that the machine is actually weaker. And here's here's the funny thing, because people will tell you, well, this, this machine will go through 18 layers of denim, no problem. And maybe they know that because they've tried it. Okay, I don't know any machine that goes through 18 layers of denim, no problem, but still. I mean, the truth is I've got an old treadle sewing machine over there that's zero amps that'll go through your hand, no problem. Just ask my mom. So here's the kicker. If a salesperson starts talking about amperage as though it is a selling point for the machine. Right now, currently, there is no like accurate, standardized way to measure the stabbing force of a sewing machine. Like, it's not a thing that gets tested. There's not a way that people have agreed is the way to test it. So the only way to really know if a machine is powerful enough to do what you want it to do is to try it. So if you're going to a reputable dealer, they should have fabric samples on hand and tester machines available for you to use. And in their fabric samples, they should have denim. If they don't, ask them why, because you should be able to test that. And then that's what you do, you test it. Okay, so just, just to be clear on this point, higher amperage does not mean a stronger machine necessarily and DC motors are not universally better than an AC motor, okay? Anybody who tries to sell you on that, like those are features that you must have, tell them to pound salt. They're working on commission, they're not looking out for you. Now, whatever machine you do go for, absolutely check out what the latest reviews are on it. But like in anything else, I recommend that you don't just look at what the average review is. So if you're scrolling through the internet and you're like, oh, this machine has three out of five stars, this one has four out of five stars. That's just the average. Actually go into the reviews. Now, if a machine has like mostly four star reviews and then there's the odd one that is like a one star review that is bringing the average down, sometimes that can just mean that those like odd, odd ones, the person just didn't know how to use the machine. But the thing to really look for is if the reviews are all over the place, because that is a sign of inconsistent manufacturing. So. Any number of things can happen there. Number one, maybe they're all made in one factory, but um, their quality control at that particular factory is not consistent. Or it could mean that there are multiple factories that are manufacturing the same one, and maybe one factory is better at doing it than the other factory. I can tell you from experience, I used to work on a production line. Okay, I didn't make sewing machines, I made whiskey, but the labels on those bottles were a lot straighter on Monday morning than they were on Friday afternoon. And I'm sure we are not alone in our quality control being a direct reflection of, a, of whether or not we were meeting our numbers that week. So, and I'm not saying not to buy those machines that have all over the place ratings. Just understand you're kind of playing a lottery there. If it's the right price point and it has the features that you want, go ahead and play that lottery, but make sure, and I mean, make sure that you do this with any machine you buy. If you're buying it from a dealer or a store, make sure you test every single feature within the first 30 days or whatever their amount of time is for returns so that you're not having to deal with warranty and jumping through hoops and all that kind of stuff. Test everything first. I've known so many people that had a great deal on a sewing machine. They bought it, they weren't ready to use it, but they're like, it's such a great deal. I'll buy it and I'll just leave it in the box so that it stays safe and then they pulled it out of the box and something was wrong with it. And they were completely out of luck because it had been sitting in a box for two years and at that point, the window to bring it back to the store has closed and they didn't even send in their warranty card. So it was at the bottom of the box. I really hope that this video today is empowering to you in that you feel like you can shop for your own sewing machine and 
feel confident in the choice that you make and feel like if you are going to walk into a sewing machine dealer that you kind of have some of the language and you you know what you're looking for and you kind of know maybe what they're going to say to you and how you can respond. Um, I really, really am so excited for all the people that have been coming into my ecosystem lately that are new sewers. Welcome, welcome. This whole month has been about you and getting you started on your sewing journey. So I really hope that this video helped you. Uh, that's all I've got for you this week. I'll see you next time.